praise be Jesus and Mary. The book of Psalms is the most wonderful collection of prayers contained in the scriptures. One way to pray the Psalms in the spirit in which they were written is to try to place yourself in the psalmist's shoes, to use your imagination and to pray the Psalms as if they came from your own heart. Often you'll hear in the Psalms the heart of someone of the psalmist who's very honest about the joys and the difficulties he faces in life and who's very open to God, who's very open with God as well. The psalmist lays it all on the table before the Lord. He doesn't hide anything. When he speaks to God, he wears no masks. He doesn't pretend that he's something he's not. He doesn't pretend that life's going well when life's not going well. But more importantly, he doesn't give up or despair. He doesn't allow the darkness around him to swallow him up. The proverb says that it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And that's what the psalmist does. He focuses on the light which comes from God, which comes from above, instead of being consumed by life's difficulties. So what's the overall message of the book of Psalms? Well, I think it can actually be found in one of the Psalms, in Psalm 62, verse 8, when we read this. It says, Trust in the Lord at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. The message of trust, of confidence in God, is really the underlying theme of all the Psalms. And of course, we know that it's not wise to trust everyone, simply because everyone is not trustworthy. Trust is based on experience. Now, I know that someone is trustworthy, for example, if I've spent time with them, if I know their character, if I know that they won't be here today and gone tomorrow, as they say. And if I know that they have at heart what's best for me and what's best for others. In short, we can trust someone if we know that they really love us and that they desire and that they do what's best for us. Now that was the experience actually of King David in his relationship with the Lord. And that name David, of course, in the Hebrew means beloved or supreme commander. David was the beloved of God. And he was also the most important of all the kings of Israel in the Old Testament. And of course, many of the Psalms are attributed to him, including the third Psalm, from which comes the responsorial Psalm in today's liturgy. Now, if you look up the third Psalm in the Bible, you'll find that at the beginning it says this, a Psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. Now, the first reading that we read today, which is taken from the second book, of Samuel speaks of that flight from Absalom, David's son, when he had templar temporarily usurped the throne from his elderly father. At the beginning of the responsorial psalm that we heard, David acknowledges that he's truly in an unhappy situation. He says this, O Lord, how many are my adversaries, many rise up against me and are saying of me, there is no salvation for him in God. So David begins by recognizing reality for what it is. He's, his life is in danger and his adversaries are convinced that God's not going to help David as he did in the past. So how does David respond? Does he rely on his military and political maneuvering to save himself? Or does he sit back and say, relax, David, pray and God will take care of everything? Well, in reality, if you know the story of David, he does both. When David learned that the men of Israel were in favor of Absalom's takeover of the throne, he fled with his servants from Jerusalem, while one of his counselors named Hushai remained in Jerusalem and convinced Absalom, who had just arrived triumphantly, not to pursue David immediately, but rather first to put up a new army, to prepare a new army against him. What did that do? Well, that gave, gave, that gave David more time to gather his troops and to prepare for battle. And so when Absalom finally did go after David, it was too late. David was ready and defeated him in the forest of Ephraim. So yes, David did use his military and political cunning to defeat Absalom. However, and this is what's reflected in the psalm today, David above all trusted in God. 
After recognizing the danger he was in in the beginning of the psalm, David writes this, But you, O Lord, are my shield. My glory, you lift up my head. When I call out to the Lord, he answers me from his holy mountain. So David had complete confidence in God. He presented his difficulties to the Lord in prayer and entrusted the outcome of the affair to the Lord to the point of being able to say this at the end of the psalm, when I lie down in sleep, I wake again for the Lord sustains me. I fear not the myriads of people arrayed against me on every side, he says. Now David's spirituality reflects the saying which was attributed to Saint Ignatius of Loyola, which says this, to pray as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on you. And that's, of course, exactly what our Saint Francis, our Franciscan saint, Saint Maximilian Kolbe, lived as well. He did everything in his power to do good and to spread devotion to Our Lady, but he relied completely on her in prayer, entrusting her to make all of his labors bear spiritual fruit for the kingdom of Christ. And guess what? That pray as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on you, spirituality, was exactly the spirituality of our Lord himself during his public life. Jesus prayed constantly to the Father during his public ministry, and he traveled, preached, taught, healed, and tirelessly formed his disciples in those three years of public ministry, at times even to the point of physical exhaustion. So we too must use the mind and the capacities that God has given us and the resource resources that are at our disposal to do what is good and to do what is necessary as best as we can. But above all, we need to entrust everything that we do to our Lord and to our Lady and especially entrust our lives to them. And that profound trust in God is what you see in much of the life of David and in many of the Psalms attributed to him. Now, when we do believe in God, when we pray to him, but we have a lack of trust in him, well, that's a sign that something's not right. I said before that trust is based on experience. Many of us in our lives have had experiences of people in authority over us. For example, our parents or significant relatives or even teachers when we were little. But these people, for one reason or another, were not trustworthy. And since they were not trustworthy, a lot of times, Children project those bad qualities onto the most important authority figure, who is God himself. A child, for example, will say to himself or herself this, well, since mom wasn't trustworthy or dad wasn't trustworthy, how can I entrust myself to God, who's an even bigger authority than mom or dad? I have to take care of things myself, the child reasons. And so sometimes if we have this kind of approach toward life, we can feel that we need to be in control, even to the point of trying to be too much in control. And then when we become easily overwhelmed or fearful, when we feel that things are getting too much, quote unquote, out of our control, then we, we run into trouble. But this is not the type of cross or the type of burden that our Lord wants us to carry, this feeling of being the need to be too much in control because we don't trust God. So what's the solution to this difficulty, to this lack of trust in God? Well, one thing is to realize where our lack of trust in the Lord really comes from. So that means trying to understand in a certain sense our past and seeing if there were any untrustworthy people in our lives, going back even to when we were children, and then trying to understand how those unhealthy or untrustworthy relationships have affected our thinking and our actions. As Catholics and as Christians, in our head at least, we know that our lack of trust in God doesn't come from God himself. Because why? He created us in his own image and likeness, as Genesis, the first chapter, tells us. He also said in the same book of Genesis after creating us that his creation was very good, Genesis 1.31. He says, for example, in Jeremiah 31.3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. And in Isaiah 41, 13, he says, I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, do not fear, I will help you. 
And of course, we know that God became one of us, that he took on our own flesh and was born of Our Lady. He died a horrendous death on the cross for us so that our sins would be forgiven and so that we could become adopted sons of the Father. He lives in our soul if we are in a state of grace. And he tells us this in John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you in heaven. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may also be. So if there's a trust issue, the problem's not with God. The problem's with something which, we have ha which has happened to us in our lives. So again, the first thing is to try to identify in our lives who has been untrustworthy with us and how that's affected our thinking and our actions. And then secondly, we need to separate that person's untrustworthiness from our understanding of God, who is completely trustworthy. As St. Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but now that I am an adult, he says, I put away childish things. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. So we as adults can stop projecting onto God the faults or failings of those who were in authority over us when we were younger, and we begin to understand that those untrustworthy people really didn't reflect and don't reflect who God really is. And thirdly, lastly, we need to correct any thought patterns in our mind which lead us to think that we have to be in control of everything because it's just not true. As I mentioned before, yes, we have to do our own part to make the best decisions and the best choices that we can, but ultimately we need to entrust everything to the Lord because we are children of God. And that means that God, that our Heavenly Father, but also Mary, our Heavenly Mother, are ultimately the, ultimately the ones who are going to provide us for everything, everything that we need. They're ultimately responsible for our well-being. Our Lord himself says in the gospel, seek first the kingdom of God, which is a kingdom where God is our loving father, Jesus is our merciful king, and Mary is our loving mother. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be given to you. Luke 21, 31. Then our Lord adds in the next verse, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father delights in giving you the kingdom. So in conclusion, I just pray that the spirit of unlimited trust in God's goodness, in God's mercy, in God's providence, and in God's love for us, which characterizes the book of Psalms and the lives of so many saints, like David and like even St. Therese of the Child Jesus, I pray that that spirit of boundless trust in God may enter into your minds and hearts and begin to truly transform you into the likeness of our Lord and of our Lady. God wills that transformation in us, and if we are open to it, he will give us the grace and the means to bring it about, especially since he desires to change us for the better more than we desire it ourselves. Now may Our Lady, who treasures all of us in her heart, help us to take to heart and to understand all these things. Praise be Jesus and Mary.